Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I want to take a bit of time today to talk about the digital health and the patient experience and what this means for folks in natural language processing. Now, I've come from to health from a little bit of a different background than some of you. I've been working in natural language processing for quite a long time and have studied patient engagement on and off over the past uh, number of years, but it hasn't been my only focus. I'm really interested in how to get computers to think about the world more like a person and less like a machine. Um, and I've done a lot of work in what's called common sense. And that's basically the idea that we can find facts about the world, put them into natural language processing, and then get more human-like interaction from that. And I'm probably most known for a concept net in that regards, which is the, the lexical resource. And for me, common sense goes beyond just understanding that coffee comes in mugs, but the other part of it is things like people want to be respected. So emotion and interaction and how that's a part of common sense. And part of the way people understand things is we have to understand the way we interact, work with, empathize with, and ultimately help others. And that encompasses everything from what we think of as effective computing to sentiment analysis and everything in between. It's how we care about each other. And it's the stuff that, like that that makes human relationships succeed. And in some sense, that includes doctor-patient relationships, which has long been my interest. We have a lot of ideas in our heads when we think about it, about what makes a good doctor-patient relationship. Um, and the truth of the matter is that there's no real answer because just like every other kind of relationship, that differs person by person. Uh, some people are looking for something that looks a lot more like, you know, the kind of classic small town doctor-patient relationship. Some people want something efficient and fact-based. And some people want something more complex. Um, and this is also true for the way we interact with each other and the way we interact with computers. Everyone's ideal relationship is a little bit different. But there's one thing that really works in common on those, and that's the idea of trust. And across both human relationships and computer relationships, uh, there's a difference in the way we trust people and the way we trust computers. We can see that from studies that have been done that we tend to be a little bit more honest with machines. We own up to the things that we've done. Uh, but research that we did for the NSF i program shows something that's a lot more complex. Some patients want human-to-human -human interaction. They want something that's a little bit more friendly and a little bit more accountable. Some want speed and some want something that's a lot more every day in that kind of relationship. So everybody wants a different kind of advisor and a different kind of relationship. But the fact that I had to cite my own research for that, as well as other statistics, shows a little bit of a problem, which is that there's a paucity of research that goes beyond um, just that basic work on how trust communication and bedside matter ultimately affect outcomes. And I believe that treating patients and people first gets you better outcomes. I mean, we all believe that. That seems very inherent. Um, but, and it makes common sense, to be honest. Um, and it reflects the kind of things we've proved in other settings. So in the absence of work in the area, we can dive into some of those other settings and try to understand that. So what would it take to understand and evaluate questions around trust in healthcare? And I think we, to start with, we need to really rephrase that question to what does it take to understand relationships in healthcare, modify and work with those relationships? Um, so better patient relationships um, tend to lead towards better self-management. There's been some work in this area in the field of medical communication. A study by the lab of Dr. Ira Wilson at Brown really shows that better relationships between doctors and patients uh, increases patient participation and self-management. In this case, it was around HIV and retroviral care. Uh, but similar results have been found in other places. Uh, when doctors and patients communicate together and work on solutions together, patients tend to remember the visit better uh, several days after the fact, remember the visit better a week after the fact. And, you know, uh, although that's not something we can prove as easily, you know, it's widely believed to have better outcomes because they understand what happened in the visit. But we know this, but empirically, it's been proved much less often than you would expect. If we turn to speech act theory as a way of thinking about this, how can we measure that relationship, right? In the previous study, we were able to look at the doctor and the patient conversation, as well as the conversations before and afterwards, and come up with a theory of what works and what doesn't. And if we turn to speech act theory, we can see how language affects relationships in other venues, albeit things like relationships between uh, students and teachers or relationships between people having debates and conversations online. A great place to look into this type of research is the work of Dr. Carolyn Rosé over at Carnegie Mellon. 
uh, there's some really interesting stuff in there. Um, things that we saw but weren't really able to prove when we were looking at some of the patient data. Things like if there is more reflexive conversation between the two parties involved, that indicates that a relationship is strengthening and that people are more likely to have their mind changed by the other person in the argument. So how does this all go down to digital health? Um, more and more we're seeing uh, chatbots and assistive systems work with patients in being able to work with and modify behavior change, especially around uh, mental health, but also around uh, other types increasingly of chronic conditions. And this is one place that this kind of technique has really shown promise is in taking various types of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT and working on it on a digital device, whether it's for mental health or for other health impacts. Uh, and this is a place that there's actually been a lot of very verified research and studies. But outside of CBT, um, papers published on the ground are a little bit thin. There's not that much information on how these things actually work. A few days before I'm recording this talk, a new result has come out that's shown that a personal robot, in this case it's a robot named Neo, we'll talk about um, them in a second, is able to actually um, help um, people modify their behavior around snacking in order to be healthier in a weight loss context. Now, Neo is not a special robot. You've probably seen these things before and you're probably scratching your head right now and thinking, where have I seen that? These are the robots that you see in the Robot World Cup, you know, the place in, that's on the TV where they kick the soccer ball around and all that kind of stuff. Um, so this isn't a robot specifically for healthcare or even for this kind of interaction. It's a pretty simple robot. So why are we able to find results like this with this kind of machine that we're not able to find in more traditional apps? Now, that requires us to think a little bit more about robots. Now, I'm a computational linguist and I've always had a difficult relationship with robots. For starters, I'm not very good at electronics. I like to make things. I like to craft and garden. But you know, if I'm trying to build a circuit, I'm more likely to burn myself than actually succeed. Um, and over time, I've had a lot of students who have worked with robots for various conversational systems. And robots, in my opinion, in my experience, at least tend to break and they tend to take up a huge amount of time. But we have something to learn as computational linguists working with dialogue systems and relationships from HRI. So HRI sits somewhere between hardware, human computer interaction or HCI and psychology. It's basically the study of interaction between humans and robots and how different factors in that interaction change the relationships that are built between them. So in some sense, HRI is HCI where you change the embodiment of the computer with social interpersonal factors. So I used a key word in there, in the, which is embodiment. So what exactly is an embodiment, you might ask? An embodiment is the way the robot has presence in the world. And presence is actually a technical term, but you can think about it as exactly that. Um, it's what it looks like and how it becomes part of your world. So in the case of the snacking study, Neo the robot is an embodiment. A lot of embodiments you might have seen in HRI or social robotics tend to be really kind of cuddly and cute. This is Leo the robot um, that lived upstairs from me at the Media Lab for many, many years. You know, and he's very cute, but there's a lot of sort of the white sleek robots or the robots that look like teddy bears or things like that. These are all different choices you can make in embodiment. And even when we're not building an actual physical robot, the things that we're looking at and working with are embodiments too the choices that we make on how the robot presents itself in the world as an embodiment, even when that robot isn't real. Although this version of Wally is made out of robot Legos, so he's kind of real. Which leads us to thinking, you know, here I am standing in a room, giving a, uh, a digital talk, rapidly wishing that I had turned my air conditioner on beforehand, even if it has background noise. So what does that mean? I'm, what am I to you right now? Am I an embodiment? I'm not standing in front of you giving this talk. As you might have figured out, I recorded this talk a long time ago in early September. I'm a video, I'm a voice, I'm an email address, I'm a phone number, and I'm my photo on LinkedIn. And you can see what I'm wearing and you can learn a little bit more about me from the examples and anecdotes I've shown in this talk. You have a character in your head, someone who likes sci-fi, who makes things, who likes theater and does design. And if, even if I were live these days, I'm always in this room, in this little box. We can't go out and get a coffee. You can't go see me in the real world. Yet somehow in this context, I've raised money, I've grown a company, I've made friends, and I've gotten to know my colleagues and their dogs. 
And while we all remain in our own physical boxes, we still build models of people, we still figure out how to interact with them, and we still somehow survive and continue to work. And something has changed, which is that embodiment and presence is no longer only just physical, and maybe it never was. It's really about presence in whatever space we're interacting with each other. Whereas I think it can be naive to say the pandemic has only accelerated trends. Um, I think it's really a case where our digital lives have been accelerated and our ability to work from home and interface with each other remotely has been accelerated by everything that's happened over the last six months. Um, people who are younger than me have for years built a whole social networks online and had deep friends that they've never met in person. A longtime collaborator met her fiance on Twitch. We've been more online for a long time, and I think it's time that we think about that in the way we think about interaction design and presence. And we're getting a lot better at acting towards devices like we act towards social robots. There's been a wide variety of work on how we interact with social agents like Alexa and Google, where um, basically we can use nonverbal cues when we're alone in a room with Alexa trying to solve a problem, we use nonverbal cues around that. So we can tilt our heads to one side or another or use facial expressions to talk to a big black cylinder when we're trying to solve a problem with it and there's no one else in the room. That's really interesting because we would have thought of those kinds of things as being triggers that you only get with a physical embodiment. Beyond that, we've been doing work um, over the past couple of years at MIT and what digital and holographic embodiments look like. And the student that I'm working with, I've worked with Emily, who has since graduated, has been building purely holographic uh, social embodiments that sort of come out of the top of the screen, the bottom of the screen. So, you know, you could think about that part in Star Wars where um, there's chess coming out of the board and you move it around and things like that. And you're getting a lot of interactions that you would get in a physical sort of space. But given that now we can think about the fact that we could get social cues out of people without having all of that physicality, what does that mean for NLP? I mean, in some degree, if we really want to abstract backwards, computers are always non-physical, right? Nobody thinks about the servers that they're interacting with when they're talking to a computer. But if we want computers in a, uh, to embody our interaction, we have to think outside of how computers typically work normally. When you're talking to a friend online, you would never mistake them for a computer. In fact, you would never mistake them for another friend. Um, and how do we know that we're interacting with other people? Whether we mean to or not, we give ourselves digital embodiments that are different. You know, we're very different in a Hangouts chat from our friends than we are in talking to our parents, than we are talking to a marketing chatbot. And when we're talking on a video call, we're different than how we talk to Alexa. If we could strip out all of the physical embodiments altogether at all, what would be left? In some ways, the answer is language. Language is how we put our presence in the world. And in many ways, that means that language is our natural user interface. It's also our most human to human interface. When we interact with each other, we convey our inner mental state, our thoughts, our emotions, and our feelings through language. It's very much a human to human interface. And in that sense, we need to be thinking about that as we're working with natural language processing for patient and human interactions. Because we know good communication leads to trust, leads to better relationships and better outcomes. So why in some sense is all of this relevant now? Why am I talking about HCI and HRI and embodiment and digital embodiment? What does that even mean? I mean, in some cases it's because we're all digital now and our world has become increasingly digital. We think that it's imperative that we build good relationships with each other and that that will help patients be motivated uh, to self-manage. And it will also help a problem that everybody knows about in digital health and doesn't talk about as much, which is the churn problem, right? And everybody knows about this anecdotally. You know, there are thousands of medical apps on Facebook, uh, not on, on uh, the App Store right now, and on Facebook, um, digital chat, and on other places, uh, if you count wellness apps and things like that. And we know that most of them have a very small user base, and most people stop using them very quickly if they include pretty much anything. And that also includes apps that are prescribed, like what we call a digital therapeutic, which is an M Health app that's been prescribed. Uh, in fact, it's really, we can quantify that way. It, we can quantify that in a really critical way. A recent study came out that showed um, that there's about a 26% drop rate from clinical trials um, for apps about um, various kinds of mental illness. And if we account for um, publication bias, that's about a 50% drop rate, which is the kind of things we see in the market. 
Now, if we really want to help all patients, we have to figure out where that 50% went and how to keep them more engaged. Uh, market research from um, research to action that other places have shown that one of the things users want is more personalization, more interaction in these types of engagements. They want to feel like they have a health coach at their side who's helping walk them specifically through a problem rather than getting the same message over and over again from a weight loss coach. And I think that some of the principles that have been discovered for things like HRI and HCI can really help us attack these problems. And I mean, this effect, re this effect continues whether or not it's um, no matter whether or not the case is with a digital app, you know, things like just depression versus placebo apps, clinically diagnosed versus self-reported, paid versus unpaid assessments, CBT versus non-CBT, mindfulness versus non-mindfulness, you still have the same sort of drop rate. It's always that high no matter what we do. So I think we have to look and say, uh, how can we access these patients? How can we help them take control of their health? What we need to be doing here is really applying these things from other disciplines. It gives us so much more to learn from each other. And one of the reasons why this is possible today is transformers. Um, we are really able to more customize and more personalize interactions with each other uh, while staying within, you know, acceptable boundaries and things like that. And that allows us to give people the tools to really take care of their health. And in some sense, now that we've gotten to this point in natural language processing accuracy, really every time that we're using NLP to interact directly with a patient, we're thinking about, we should be thinking about HCI. And it's in that sense, it's all about that design. Now, I wanna take a few moments and say that there's also other things for relationship and trust and communication that make a lot of difference. Um, so humans and computers together, rather than computers alone, uh, often get better results. You know, when we talked about the, the results we had earlier where some people are more trusty of a computer, but they also feel more motivated by interacting with a human, um, we can see that a human and a computer together can do more alone. Clearly, we should not be leaving computers alone to deal with um, high-risk patients or other sorts of situations. So I often think that we, in our rush to automate, don't realize that the computer and the human can do together can do more than either can do separately. And it's always important to talk about bias in healthcare. Um, and bias in AI if you're not careful. If we're looking at doctor-patient interactions and we're trying to model what works and what doesn't, we have to realize that there are biases in the US healthcare system that are quite systematic. And if we're teaching an AI and we're having it learn from doctors, we don't want to be magnifying those biases, discovering them and pushing them forward. That's really something we don't want to do. Um, so we don't want to just blindly um, reflect either the biases in a particular doctor-patient conversation or in a, a body of doctor-patient conversations as a whole. And if we go back and we look at some of the data and even some of the retroviral studies, we'll definitely see um, some of that stuff come into play. Another really important aspect here is trust. And trust comes with good relationships. If we build a great relationship with our user and then we use their data in ways that they are not interested in, that's really gonna break that trust down in the long term. And I think one of the biggest boundaries to people adopting these kinds of systems um, is trust. Um, and is being able to know where the data comes from. So always think about trust and privacy and security and give the user control over that kind of stuff. And I think it's very important that we, we talk about that. Beyond that, it's explainability and transparency, right? We need to be able to, even if we're using a transformer-based system or a more complicated new system, we need to be able to explain why we're making the decisions we're making if the user needs to know about that. Uh, and I think that's very, very important. Um, and there's many different kinds of explainability, and I'm sure we'll talk about that throughout this conference quite a bit. Um, all these things are really quite critically important um, in being able to look at all of these things. And in some sense, these are all parts of HCI, right? It's really past time that NLP took HCI seriously and realized that language is a user interface, and we need to be looking at um, the way these things work. You know, I mentioned explainability on the previous slide. Um, or, there have been lots of results in the last two years that said explainability do, done wrong does more to hurt user trust than no explainability at all. So we have to look to these studies and really deeply understand them. It's critical for AI and conversation in medicine. And any patient-facing ap application needs to look at HCI across different disciplines to understand how to work with its users. Even if there's not enough clinical results in this particular field, there are results in other fields that indicate how computers and humans should interact together.
No, I think my interest in all this, just briefly at the end, comes from something new we've been working on. Um, we had been working on digital character work at the MIT Media Lab, where up until maybe about six months ago at this point, I, I was a research scientist. Um, and I've spun a couple companies out of MIT. But really what we were originally doing is trying to model conversations um, and digital characters in more of an entertainment context. And when we really became understanding of the engagement problem in healthcare, you know, we got a lot of uh, positive feedback to go into that direction. And so we've been very interested in applying what we've been working on there. Uh, so this is an early stage venture that we're really excited about. Um, and in that sense, I'm also really excited to look for folks that could work with me on everything from especially evaluation of patient facing dialogue uh, down to everything else that we're working on. So I want to thank you guys today for um, taking the time to chat with me and I'm going to be available for questions after this talk. Thank you.